Well, uh, it had to happen. Uh, I have been voted off of the contest, uh, but I am kind of sort of relieved because there is this level of stress that comes with every round of this contest, even on the ones where I didn't get voted off. Every time that I got that message, hey, the deliberations are here, I was always very stressed. Okay, is this going to be the week? And uh, this was just not my week, and I'm okay with that. Uh, uh, if it helps at all, it does help me a little bit. Uh, it seems like the judges were all really sad to vote me off, so uh, that does help me. It makes me realize that I was this close, and I just didn't make it. I'm really glad that all of the other uh, people who are still in the contest are in the contest. Uh, I wish all of you the best of luck. Of course, you can't all have the best of luck. Uh, there can be only one. Uh, and uh, I'm very eagerly going to keep watching this contest to see who's going to win. Uh, I'm very anxious to see how that's going to turn out. And uh, like I said, I'm uh, you know kind of relieved because now, now that it's over, uh, of course I didn't win, but there's just a level of... Uh, ease that I'm at now. I'm no longer stressing about, okay, how did I do? And uh, to answer some uh, very quick uh, criticisms that were leveled at my video this round, I do agree with a lot of what you guys said. Uh, in retrospect, before I got some of the uh, the uh, criteria, not criteria, critiques about my video, I was kind of thinking, you know what, uh, like the Guardians of the Galaxy joke at the end didn't really work. Uh, I was kind of on the fence about that anyway, and talking so much about uh, budget, uh, comparing it to Guardians of the Galaxy, I think would have worked better if we had more time in this video, or if... Uh, I could have just done it in a quicker amount of time instead of spending so much time talking about that. And those were some things that I was thinking maybe didn't work anyway, and then other people saying that those things didn't work as well made me realize, yeah, I probably should have, before uploading that video, maybe just taken an objective look at it, say, does this work, or do I need to do another couple of takes? Uh, so that's, you know, if anything, I'm really glad that it happened now and it wasn't one of my other videos. I'm really glad I was able to be in the contest as long as I was and that I learned a lot of things. I really did learn a lot of stuff in this contest. I learned how to make my videos no longer be uh, uh, the small screen that takes up like, you know, half of a YouTube video page. Uh, I didn't know how to change that. Uh, there's just little stuff that the, uh, the, the panelists, uh, they would have problems with my video saying, you know what, don't do this. And I realized, you know what, there's really no good reason that I am doing that. Uh, I need to change it up and see if it works better. And I legitimately think that I'm a better reviewer because of this contest. And we only made it four, I only made it four rounds in. So that's not, you know, uh, in such a short amount of time, I like to think that I have become a better uh, reviewer, and so uh, I'm excited that I was even able to make it this far. Uh, I do appreciate being considered for the contest. I am curious if I was one of the eight who was meant to be in the contest, or if I was one of the additional four who was accidentally included in the contest, and that's probably something I'm never going to find out, but I'm very curious if I was meant to be in the contest. So of course, it's moot now, but that's okay. Uh, I do just want to say thanks to everybody for uh, keeping up with the videos. Uh, thanks for people who uh, are interested in my channel. Uh, thanks to the panelists for uh, giving very honest critiques and criticisms, etc., of my videos. Uh, Captain Logan, don't worry, I'm still gonna send you stuff in the mail. I've got some stuff up there on that bookshelf that I need to send you. Uh, I'll still keep sending you stuff. I don't hate you. I don't hate any of you guys. You're all like, you know, uh, distant, distant cousins to me. Uh, I love you all. Uh, so that's all I have to say. Uh, I've set a bar very high for all you future uh, contestants uh, in this contest. I have done the shirtless thing. Uh, next year, someone's going to have to go pantless. It's just going to have to happen. Uh, that's where we're at right now. So uh, I really enjoyed this contest, really appreciate being in the contest, and I really appreciate uh, the... It had to happen. Uh, it, I appreciate that it was a hard choice for you guys to make. Uh, if it had been just a really quick, well, that guy's got to go, I probably would have been sad. I would have been over there in the corner crying. Uh, but I'm glad that it happened the way that it did. Uh, so thank you guys. Uh, I will see you guys, well, you know, on my own channel. I won't be seeing you in the contest anymore. Uh, like I said, wish uh, the best of luck to all of you contestants. And now I will no longer be uh, appraised of the situation uh, when you guys are. I'm going to be following this contest along with uh, the rest of the audience. So uh, that's going to be really fun for me. I'm going to be uh, watching this contest. It's going to be a little bit more fun for me to watch the contest now, I think. So uh, that's all I have to say. Uh, see you guys later. 
Hello everyone, I'm Captain Logan, and welcome back to Who Reviews the Reviewer Season 4. It's round 5, and we've got a really interesting challenge for our remaining 6 contestants this time. We asked everybody to review the original series Star Trek uh, movie trilogy, Wrath of Khan, Search for Spock, and Voyage Home. So what we've done is we've split them into two different groups, and each group is reviewing the same trilogy, and I asked the guys to choose which of them would review which movie in the trilogy, and we'll be looking in the deliberations later on at each of these as kind of a product uh, put together by three different people individually to create one uh, cohesive series of reviews, and uh, it'll be really interesting to see how that turns out. So anyway, without further ado, here are the videos and the interviews for this round, and then uh, in a couple days, you'll see the deliberations. Thanks for watching. sucks. Said no one ever. But there's good reason for that. It's a film that's managed to stand the test of time because it succeeds in not only telling a great Star Trek story, but also reaching beyond its intended audience to tell a story that asks questions about the very ideas of life and death, youth and old age, and creation and destruction. And space worms in your ear. Wrath of Khan scores points with me right off the bat for not being self-indulgent. It wastes no time, and every scene directly progresses the plot or raises questions that help the audience to piece together some of the bigger ideas the story is getting at. I couldn't believe that a movie with this much plot was only an hour and 53 minutes long, and yet nothing feels rushed. This may be due to the fact that this movie expects you to know who these characters are already, which is very fair because unless you've never seen Star Trek, it's not the first time you've met them. This movie is very much about Kirk dealing with the fact that he's getting older. It seems as if his time to shine is past, and it's hard for him to handle being an admiral and no longer a captain. Hey Bones, why are you looking at the camera? Stop looking at the the camera! It's not necessarily getting older that bothers Kirk, but more so that he feels older due to the fact that he's watching as a new younger group of cadets are being groomed to become the next crew of the Enterprise. Bones even gives Kirk reading glasses as a birthday present, which seemed to be there as a physical representation of Kirk's struggle with feeling older. I saw an interview with William Shatner once where he said he wants to live as long as he can and that he doesn't want to die, and I think his performance here was so believable because he was able to take those personal feelings and integrate them into the performance. Now let's talk about Khan because his name is in the title, but could we just take a moment to carefully appreciate his amazing fact? Fashion sense. I mean, just look at his sexy space mullet and his weird collar thing that looks like a giant worm around his neck. Not only is he a space fashionista, but also one of the most memorable villains ever put on film. Khan is intelligent, genetically enhanced, and most importantly determined to make Kirk and the crew of the Enterprise feel his anger. Fans of the show were already familiar with the character from the episode Space Seed, but instead of just recycling his motivations from that episode, they decided to build on them by making him personally furious with Kirk because he left Khan and his crew on the planet of Sadie Alpha 5 where many of his people, including his wife, were killed by space worms in their ears. Eventually Khan is able to commandeer a starship and is ready to kick some bass. Yeah, he really hates fish. This film does a great job of using action to further drive the narrative. If we take a look at the first encounter between Kirk and Khan, we can see that Khan's intelligence and fashion sense is what really makes him such a dangerous foe. But Kirk has so much experience and is able to outsmart Khan because he knows a way to lower the shields on Khan's ship. While Khan is very intelligent and stylish, he still wouldn't know that Kirk could do that, and so the film makes a point that experience can be more effective than just raw intellect. Might I add that Kirk puts on his reading glasses momentarily in this scene, which again calls back to the theme of age, but this time showing the positives that come with it, the main one being experience. Themes of life and death are all over this film. The movie opens with death, <coughs> ends with death, <coughs> but also talks about death and its relation to life by introducing the Genesis device created by Carol and David Marcus, which will create life if used on a lifeless planet, but as Spock points out, will destroy life in favor of its new matrix if used on an already life-filled planet. Hey Spock, how do you know that? I know you're the science officer and all, but you didn't build the device, so how do you know that? TELL ME! And how freaking lucky is Khan that the only living species on CD Alpha 5 can pretty much be used to brainwash people to do what you want. And I always laugh when Khan asks for all the information about Genesis, and Kirk goes, Genesis? What's that? Wow, Kirk, that may be the worst attempt to fool someone ever. And then there's this one random engineer who helps up this other engineer so he doesn't get crushed by this door, and then he falls over and the guy he just helped up just starts limping away. What a freaking horrible friend! But these are just small things that I either found really funny or slightly bothersome. <coughs> The final act does such a great job of tying all of these ideas and themes together by having Spock sacrifice his own life in what is one of the most emotional death scenes I've ever seen. Throughout the film, there's talk of the Kobayashi Maru, the simulation designed to see how cadets deal with certain deaths. Kirk is the only person to ever beat this no-win scenario, meaning he's never faced death as Savik puts it, but Spock dying changes all that. Finally, Kirk's faced this scenario where the only way to win was by also losing a lot. Kinda like the biggest loser. 
After Spock's coffin is sent out into space, we get a scene of Kirk where he realizes that one of the lenses of his glasses is cracked, while the other is left intact. Now if earlier the glasses represented age, and then later represented experience that comes with age, then in this moment they represent one of the saddest parts of getting older. Losing people that are close to you, while you carry on, intact. But it's not all sad, because in the very same scene, David reveals to Kirk that he's proud to be his son, which represents the final and most rewarding thing that comes with age, a legacy that will continue on even after your death. David is Kirk's legacy, and Spock's legacy is all the lives that he saved by giving his own. Just like Genesis, out of death comes new life. Star Trek The Wrath of Khan gets six squatches out of six. Now let's review the search for Spock. Guys log, upload date 72415. Captain Logan has assigned the remaining six cadets engaged in Federation WRTR to review one of three Star Trek pictures, which include Wrath of Khan, Search for Spock, and Voyage Home. I have chosen to tackle Search for Spock. This is commonly known as one of the middle of the road Star Trek movies, the one that splits a lot of Trekkers and casual movie fans in the middle. It's not completely lowest common denominator material like The Final Frontier, but it's not held in as high regard as, say, Wrath of Khan, First Contact, or Star Trek 09. While number two is without question the best of the bunch, I personally enjoy out of the original six movies, three and four the most. Is it because at this point the actors have been portraying these characters for some time and had gotten more comfortable in the roles? Or because of technological advancements the special effects had gotten better? Or because, unlike any of its predecessors, the late but great Leonard Nimoy, who also plays Spock, took over the director's chair? These are some contributing factors, but I think there's a bit more to it with the third film. While it's by no means a perfect movie, I think it's a lot better than most people give it credit for. Picking up after the events of Wrath of Khan, Admiral Kirk and his bridge crew risk their careers stealing the decommissioned Enterprise to return to the restricted Genesis planet in order to recover the body of their Vulcan friend Spock. Where they encounter hostile Klingons led by Krug, planning to steal the secrets of a powerful terraforming device known as Genesis. And unlike later sci-fi films, this movie can correctly spell Genesis, thank god. If I still care about the characters throughout the events of one movie, then I can't totally say it fails. Like the IMF in Mission Impossible or the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the heart of Star Trek is the characters, and they're written really well here. At first, I kind of felt that bringing back Spock would take away from the thematic meaning and the ending of Wrath of Khan, but I actually really like how it's done here. All of the crew members' personalities or character actions complement each other in one way or another, and we really see how lost they are without Spock. Kirk is impulsive, he acts and never thinks about the consequences of his actions. Whereas Spock always thinks a few steps ahead, but has trouble acting it all out sometimes. He's the voice of reason, and I really love seeing the crew and him reunited in the end. Most of the performances from the actors are really great. They have a lot of energy and charisma, but they can also do the more slow and serious moments too, which is good. However, the one actor that really brings the movie down for me some is Robin Curtis as Savick. She plays her character so bland and monotone like Qui-Gon Jinn in The Phantom Menace. Savick works really well in the script, but Curtis's performance really wrecks it. It's a real shame that Kirstie Alley, who played Savick in the previous film, couldn't reprise her role for this one. This is where I think the movie loses a lot of people. The film before this featured Khan as the villain, and he's gone down as one of the best antagonists in the series. He was a theatric, zany, crazy villain who really got to Kirk, but to follow that up, our big bad guy here is this one-note villain who's really forgettable. As we all know, Christopher Lloyd is a great actor, but unfortunately he doesn't have much to work with here as Krug. He's actually quite indicative of a lot of villains in big superhero or sci-fi movies that come out today, who don't have any real depth, they're just kind of there so the story can move further. The big plot device that motivates him and his gang of Klingons is the Genesis device. If Khan's motivation was this simple and shallow in the last movie, then Captain Kirk and company would have crushed him in a second. He might as well have just brought back Khan as the villain, or gotten a different Khan, like, I don't know, Chaka Khan. I digress. While the movie excels at a lot, the cookie-cutter villain and broad motivations hold it back. The death of Kirk's son, David Marcus, is often regarded by many who've seen the movie as being poorly executed. I agree somewhat. It's really hastily done in an abrupt way because Leonard Nimoy was maybe going for a more realistic execution of it from the script to on screen, but it's a huge tone shift from the rest of the movie and sticks out really awkwardly. But at the same time, I'm kind of glad they didn't melodramatically dwell on his death with a huge, no. 
like a lot of other sci-fi epics might have. For me, the standout bit in the movie that showcases how great a director Mr. Nimoy is, is the destruction of the Enterprise. The cinematography, music, and use of miniatures are all brilliant, but it's directed in a way that can get an emotional response out of us as audience members really well. Speaking of music, the score composed by James Horner, who sadly passed away just recently, is really good too. He adapts some of Jerry Goldsmith's material from the first movie, but gives it his own feel. It sounds great, this is one of my favorite albums of his, it's definitely up there with his work on Titanic. While the story is sometimes a bit cookie-cutter, not every actor turns in a stellar performance and the villain's a bit weak, Star Trek III The Search for Spock is still very enjoyable and I think the positives really do outweigh the negatives as a whole. If I was rating it for how much I enjoy it, I'd go with a 3.5 out of 4, but looking at it at an analytical and critical level, I feel it's more appropriate to go with a 3. Thanks for watching everyone, this is Kai and as always, don't forget to live long and prosper. Star Trek IV The Voyage Home is the fourth installment in the Star Trek film franchise, and the third in a trilogy starting with Wrath of Khan. Leonard Nimoy returns to the director's chair after making his directorial debut in Star Trek III, and returns to the franchise Nicholas Meyer to co-write the script with producer Harv Bennett. Here, Kirk and his crew continue their adventure as they ready to leave the planet Vulcan to be court-martialed by Starfleet. As this is happening, a mysterious probe is making its way to Earth. From here, Kirk leads the team on a time-traveling odyssey to 1986 San Francisco to bring to the future two humpback whales in hopes of answering the call of the probe and saving the day. So how is Star Trek for The Voyage Home? I quite enjoy it. While it's not as dense and thought-provoking as Wrath of Khan, it's still a light-hearted, fun adventure with a great sense of humor, while also retaining some of the big ideas you watch Star Trek for. Let's start with the direction, because this was the element I was most surprised with. As I said before, Nimoy made his first directorial effort with Star Trek III, but in The Voyage Home, I think he found his calling in comedy. And it's not just because the jokes are funny either. They are, but Nimoy actually presents intelligent comedy filmmaking. Most of the humor here is from the fish out of water scenario, but these situations are instantaneously funny with these characters. So Nimoy's approach is that of minimal editing and a camera that observes the comedy. Look at the following scenes. Chekhov and Uhura asking around for nuclear vessels, Bones giving the dialysis patient medicine, Scotty using the computer, Kirk and Spock on the bus. Compare this to contemporary comedies like The Interview, where in the span of 60 seconds there are 20 cuts. I guess I'm talking about this so much because Star Trek IV features some insightful commentary about the popularity of today's profane entertainment. In the scene on the bus, Kirk says, Nobody pays any attention to you unless you swear every other word. Humorous, yes, but I feel this is still as relevant today as it was in 1986. In the year of 2014, the R-rated comedy saw an increase of popularity at the box office with the likes of Neighbors and 22 Jump Street. And the comedy genre as a whole has become interested in pushing the envelope as what you can see and show. And when they don't, we get... <laughs> I really enjoy how this movie critiques our entertainment and sort of challenges today's top talents to get more clever with their material. But it wouldn't be Star Trek without the beloved characters. Spock being recently resurrected and seemingly have lost his humanity creates a nice little character arc for him that is told and resolved perfectly. It's great seeing Kirk in an environment he's alien to but knows enough about to maneuver his way through. Everyone else is their usual lovable selves, but I do feel like some get lost in the shuffle of their various missions, like, oh yeah, Sulu's in this movie. I also see this film as a nice companion piece of sorts to Wrath of Khan, where in that movie saw the past coming back to destroy us, this movie sees our salvation lying in the past to correct the wrongs we've made in the future. There are also some thematic ties to Search for Spock. That movie had themes of life coming from death that I feel weren't nearly explored enough. In The Voyage Home, we see the crew bringing life where there is none, and it's perfectly realized. While there is a lot to like in Star Trek IV, there are some elements that are noticeably weaker. I think the first act is a little rushed to get us to 1986, all the events just seem to happen without much discussion or debate amongst the key characters. I'm also conflicted about the probe. While I love the mystery and the mystique that surround this monolithic entity, I can't help but think it's a little contrived from a screenwriting aspect. It's just there to cause a conflict, and once the day is saved, it just leaves. 
No, I don't want subtitles for the thing. That'd be stupid. But I'd like it to do something except cause a conflict and leave. One last thing. I think it's odd for a movie to open with a Klingon declaring, there shall be no peace as long as Kirk live! Only to have no resolution to that subplot whatsoever. This is especially weird when everything else in the movie is resolved in the end, and there's a strong sense of finality to this long three-movie journey. But, at the end of the day, Star Trek IV The Voyage Home is too much fun to dislike. We get to see these notoriously likable characters together again in a light and humorous adventure surrounded by dazzling effects, especially those miniature whales. And there's just enough commentary and thematic heft to boot. Star Trek IV The Voyage Home gets a 7 out of 10. Thank you very much for watching, and until next time, live long and prosper. Okay, so bear in mind, I'm kind of doing this a little more off the cuff. I don't have a script in front of me or anything, I'm just improvising this. And I know it's really unprofessional, but I don't have, like, I'm actually not doing this on my camera, I'm just doing this on my uh, cell phone, or smartphone, or whatever. Um, just kind of holding it up, it's more of a vlog style thing, I don't know. Uh, anyway, uh, who reviews the reviewers round five? Uh, this was the trilogy challenge round where we uh, we review we paired up into groups and we each individually uh, reviewed one of three Star Trek movies that Captain Logan and the judges picked out for us. I got Search for Spock. Uh, anyway, it, uh, it was a lot of fun this round to collaborate with the other contestants because that's something we hadn't done in previous rounds. Uh, Connor Nielsen and Squatch Gang were a lot of fun to work with. Uh, I'm um, having. I, I I know that this is probably if you're not involved in the contest and you're just watching that you probably don't know. Uh, having not seen the deliberations yet, how what goes down, kind of like, you know, who gets voted off and who who stays in. So I don't want to spoil any of that. Um, I'll say that this uh, round I I was kind of like experiencing a little bit of burnout. Like I, I'm not saying like I was tired of the contest. I didn't want to do it, but like. So at a time, it was it was all happening at a time when I felt kind of like burnt out and not really I, I just wasn't feeling that creative, and uh, I don't know like I just you know this is you know a period where I just needed to you know chill out a little and uh, I procrastinated making the video for a while so I was kind of like staying up like the day of the dead like the the night of the day of the deadline if that makes any sense working on it uh, the script I was rushing my lines and the script was really rushed and I think that was my ultimate downfall this round. Uh, and I, I advise that, uh, for any of the remaining contestants that you don't make the same mistake that I did and take your time with it. Uh, that's about it. This is Kai, and as always, I will see you all next time. Hey guys, got the questions here. I'm going to answer them for you, so let's do it. Okay, so, uh, why did I pick the subject for review? So obviously, this week we didn't really pick the subjects for review. Uh, we were kind of assigned, uh, you know, you could either do Star Trek 2, II, Star Trek 3, or Star Trek 4. And um, Kai was really um, wanting to do Star Trek 3, and Connor didn't really care which one, and I didn't really care which one I reviewed either. So, um, you know, we just kind of wound up deciding, okay, I'll do two, Kai will do three, Connor will do four. So, uh, that's pretty much the only, uh, uh, you know, that was the only re reasoning behind it, you know. Um, so, the hardest part of making this review, the hardest part was for sure, um, you know, Having something original and new to say about a movie like Wrath of Khan that has been talked about so many times on the internet, uh, there are so many Wrath of Khan reviews you can find, and you know so, pe so many people have uh, given their take on the film, and it's you know it's it's such like a beloved film, so uh, having something just new and original to say about it, and not just reiterating what other people have already said, that was definitely the hardest part about making this review. Um, what would I do differently uh, if I could do it over again? Um, I, I don't know. I always have like the same answer for this. I always kind of just say like I I tweak the writing and I tweak the editing. But I mean like that really is it, you know? Like you know, it's just really hard to know when like okay, this is done. This is perfect. This is the final product. So you know, I'd just probably try to make the review uh, just a little bit more polished uh, and better in any way that I could. Um, yeah. So uh, uh, do I think I'll get top banana this round? So. Um, I have no idea. Uh, I think that, uh, I think my review is good, and I think I totally could get Top Banana, but I also think that there are a lot of good reviews this round, and everyone is so close this round. 
I think that anyone could get eliminated, and I think that anyone could get top banana. And I have no idea which team will win. I have seen all the reviews, and even seeing them, seeing them all, I still don't really know who's gonna win and who's gonna go home, uh, or be eliminated, not go home. Uh, but yeah, so, um, uh, what was it like reviewing something that we didn't get to pick ourselves? So, I was actually, you know, Star Trek II, um, or, you know, any of the Star Trek films for that matter, I'm actually very familiar with them all. I love Star Trek, so I was just like, okay, awesome, Star Trek, this is cool. Um, so, uh, that was actually kind of fun, really getting assigned, uh, you know, uh, getting assigned something is actually really kind of fun, because it's, it just makes it feel, like, a little bit more competitive, because you know there's somebody else who's going to be reviewing the same movie that you're reviewing, so it kind of, like, puts you head-to-head -head against someone, in a way. Um, and it's just really uh, kind of cool just, you know, having this time like we were given a task. Uh, that was just, I don't know, that was pretty cool. So, um, how closely did we work, uh, as a team, did we work together? Um, we didn't actually feel the need to, like, make our reviews really, like, intertwined and connected. Um, we just kind of decided, okay, if, you know, if I do a review in my style the best I can, and Kai does a uh, review in his style the best he can, and Connor does a review in his style the best he can, uh, we kind of, you know, thought, you know, I'm, that should be enough to, you know, stand up against uh, whatever reviews the other team put out. So uh, we just kind of decided, okay, let's just each do it the way we want to do it, and we'll just make a really solid set of reviews. And I think we really did a good job of that. I was, like, really, really happy with both Kai and Connor's reviews. I think their reviews are great. So, um, yeah, we just kind of did our own thing, and uh, I think it worked out in the end. So, I guess that was all the question, guys. Uh, hopefully, I'll see you next round. Peace out. Bye. Hey there, Connor here to answer some questions for round... Five of who reviews the reviewers. So, I think I should probably start this off by saying I've never seen any Star Trek anything prior to my reviewing, uh, the fourth one. So, I watched the second, the third, and then the fourth one, which I reviewed. Uh, I tried watching the first one. I fell asleep, and I was running out of time, so I didn't try to go back and rewatch it. I really liked them. I think Star Trek might be something right up my alley. So, thank you, judges, or Captain Logan, whoever's idea this was for turning me on to Star Trek. So, thank you. Um, so, I guess that should probably inform... I think pretty much everyone else in this competition had at least some experience with Star Trek. So, I feel like immediately I was at a disadvantage. So how do I feel about my chances with this? Uh, because this, this is the team challenge, I think if my team loses, then I'm probably going to be going. That, that's my uh, assumption. Um, I think Squatch and Kai produced probably their best videos yet in the entire competition with this round, and I didn't. So, I mean, right there, uh, they immediately are showing improvement and I'm not, so I think I'm going to be g getting the axe. However, I do think these two teams are pretty evenly matched. I think everyone provided excellent videos, and I, it's so cool to be in this competition, but it's also like, I have no idea if I'm going home or not. Uh, compared to last round, I think last round was a better, more creative review. I kind of was able to play with that uh, whole one take, no editing kind of gimmick. And with this one, I was more or less just trying to be more knowledgeable about Star Trek than anything else. There was also no communication amongst uh, uh, the three of us outside of what movies we were going to be reviewing, so there wasn't really a whole lot of connective tissue, uh, except for a very smart decision by Squatch. So, his little ending was pretty cool. If I had more time, what would I do differently? So, my original script, uh, there's, there's quite a bit I didn't include, and a lot of it is the, uh, what I say about modern, um modern comedy and modern filmmaking sensibilities, and I kind of dissected that more. 
and I and I kind of go. Uh, there's one scene in uh, in Voyage Home, which is the bus stop scene. It's only four takes long, and I kind of broke that scene down and I compared it to that scene from the interview, which is the uh, interview with Eminem. The first sixty seconds of that scene has twenty cuts. That's ridiculous, and like your mind is constantly trying to like reassess, it, get used to this new angle. Uh, so right there. I, there was already a lot of that anyway, so I cut a lot of that out. I, I'm glad I did. I think that the second half of the review works a little bit better than the first half. The first half is a lot more going into filmmaking, uh, in like, kind of like what Leonard Nimoy did. And then the second half is very much bam, 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 bam. Here's what I like, here's what I dislike. Uh, so I think the... It's a good, not great review. Um, not my best by a long shot, but I'm glad I was able to watch these movies. And you know what? I like the, I like the video I made. Um, so yeah, I think that's all I really have to say. And uh, hope I make it. Hello. Hello, that match kid. Look, no pressure on the review or anything, but um, don't be surprised if I take some impractical precautions for this uh, challenge. Can I just? Uh, peace out, team player. You know, I don't know much about Star Trek, but I do know something about good friggin' movies. And Star Trek The Wrath of Khan is a good friggin' movie. It's got an intimidating villain, amazing dynamics between all of its central characters, and it has a science fiction idea that parallels the story arc of our main character. Our story opens with Kirk moaning and groaning about how he's old and space travels for the young and all he can do now is, I don't know, sit around and look at his space antiques. A new crew is being trained to take over the Enterprise, and it's got old Kirk thinking about the glory days. Meanwhile, a villain from those very glory days is about to, um, avenge himself. This sets the stage for a story about renewal and rebirth. Remember like 30 seconds ago when I said, and it has a science fiction idea that parallels the story arc of our main character. Well, that's where Genesis comes in. Genesis terraforms planets, taking something barren and making it new and livable. Dr. Marcus claims it'll make Kirk feel young, like when the world was new. A line echoed by Kirk at the end of the film, when he says that he feels young. At the end of this ordeal, he feels renewed and vibrant again, as if he was affected by Genesis itself. Of course, Kirk isn't the only one stuck in the past. So we've got Carol, David, and of course, Khan. Carol and David are here to help show Kirk that he looks at the past with rose-tinted glasses. Yes, that Star Trekking life of adventure was exciting, but now Kirk has to look at what it cost him, a life that could have been, but wasn't. Alright, so if Kirk is stuck in the past, then Khan has a freaking summer home there. Seriously, not only is he completely fixated on getting revenge on Kirk, but he's still whining about when he was a ruler on Earth. Kirk's character arc is all about coming to terms with who he is now and realizing he's still in control of his own destiny. Khan, in contrast, shows a complete lack of control over his destiny. He's just resigned himself to be completely dominated by the past rather than liberate himself from it. And he's given several opportunities to turn away, escape while he's ahead. But instead, his obsession with Kirk causes him to make rash decisions. Like when the Enterprise heads into the Matara Nebula, Khan's first mate warns him, Sir, we can't go in there, our shields will be useless. And Khan's all like, No, he tasks me. He tasks me. Khan's refusal to change leads to his downfall as Kirk takes advantage of Khan's ego. Finally, we have Spock's death, a scene that has been forever etched into the minds of filmgoers and science fiction fans. Kirk throughout the film says very defiantly that he doesn't believe in the no-win scenario, and he still hasn't faced one. As Spock says this was his solution, Spock is forced into a no-win scenario by Khan, and it's hard to see this as anything other than Kirk paying the price for leaving Khan stranded for 15 years without bothering to check in on him. That seems harsh, but it fits the themes of the film. Kirk's arrogance and refusal to change in the past cost him a family, and now it's cost him a friend. I think it's safe to say that Kirk not only feels young again, but he's been truly humbled by the end of this film. 
All of these big ideas are handled extremely well, and yet the movie still knows how to have fun. Yeah, I laugh every time Savick comments on how human Kirk is. Spock's response? Nobody's perfect. Oh! Snap! Kirk's gonna need some Genesis to recover from that sick burn! <laughs> Why did Kirk never check in on Khan? I mean, did he just forget? Or did he never intend to? I would have liked a line about that. And how did nobody know that SETI Alpha 6 exploded? That seems like the kind of thing Starfleet would, you know, try to keep track of. Also, Khan's motivation seems a little weak. It's just given to us in lines of dialogue. I get that the movie is basically a sequel to the episode Space Seed, so you could just watch that. But a movie should still stand on its own. Wrath of Khan deserves every bit of praise it's gotten. Most of my complaints are nitpicky and don't detract from the overall effect of the movie. It's a phenomenal science fiction film that still knows how to have fun despite being surrounded by some really thought-provoking ideas. I'm that Mac Kid, and I have a phone call to make. We have a problem. I'm a proponent that it shouldn't be a prerequisite to read Incoming the phone call, Mr. Cool. Let the call so go through now. Catching the caller through now. Hey, Mr. Cool, it's that Mackin. What do you want, Matt? It's good plot. He contacted me. I think he's trying something. No, good plot's not gonna get to me. I'm too far away for him to get to me. Look, I know you probably think you're safe, but he's a supervillain. He can find you. He's not gonna sabotage the review. He knows he needs us. Look, I know he needs us, but he's paranoid. He's probably got something crazy planned, and I'm worried about it. Even if he tries, I'm gonna get the review done right now so he has nothing to sabotage. All right, fine. If you're not gonna listen to me, I'll just figure out something to do about good plot on my own. All right, bye. Have fun dealing with him. <sighs> Hey there guys, it's Mr. Cool 210 here with another review for you. This time we're taking a look at the third film in the Star Trek franchise, Star Trek The Search for Spock. The film stars William Shatner and Christopher Lloyd as Captain James T. Kirk and uh I got it now. Krug. Yeah, that's it. After the death of Spock in The Wrath of Khan, we discover that Spock's consciousness has been put into Dr. McCoy. Not only that, but Spock's body seems to have come back to life on Genesis. With this knowledge, Kirk, McCoy, and the rest of the crew have to journey to Genesis to find the new Spock and give him his consciousness back. Now before we get things started, let me make something clear. I've never been a big Star Trek fan. I've always been a fan of a different sci-fi show that came out in the 1960s. This is from the perspective of a casual fan. But now, as always, let's move on to some positives. One of the things about the movie I really enjoyed was the performances for most of the actors, particularly McCoy, Cruz, and Sulu. McCoy especially is very good comedy relief, while also being the crux of the plot. Most films that I've seen have tried that and just ended up making the character irritating, so I have to commend this film for that. The special effects are also really top-notch for the time, especially a scene later in the film involving the Enterprise, which I won't spoil for you here. Finally, I gotta say I really enjoyed the score by the late, great James Horner. A lot of good, memorable tracks throughout, although it reminded me a lot of the Superman score by John Williams, which definitely isn't a bad thing. But now, I think it's best we move on to the more negative side of things. One of the biggest issues with the movie is too full with the writing. Firstly, I found the actual story of the film to be quite stretched out. Despite this film barely going over the hour and a half mark, the film's pace is very slow, and feels like they're padding it to get it to that feature length mark. And secondly, I feel that the film is too much of a direct sequel, if that makes any sense. Now for most films in a series, this is fine, but no other Star Trek film has had that much to do with the previous film in its series. You could watch them all on their own fine and still get along okay. And while this film does recap the end of the previous film and give you some bits of info that would be necessary, other things that could help with an emotional scene aren't mentioned early on enough in the film for you to care. Certain elements that could have only taken a few seconds to give us a quick reminder of who certain characters are for those unfamiliar would have been appreciated. For example, I would have had no idea this character was Kirk's son until a certain scene in the film if I hadn't watched the previous ones, and that's not something that should be left out. Also, Shatner really is the weak point in terms of acting in this film. I mean, he does okay, but there are some times where he really goes into the hammy acting, and it turns moments that would be really sad into a really comedic scene. 
Finally, while I did enjoy Christopher Lloyd's performance as the Klingon Krug, the writing behind the character is almost non-existent. We don't really know much about him, his motivation, and he has very little screen time as well, giving him very little presence in my opinion. If it wasn't for how Lloyd portrayed the character, I would have forgotten this character was even in the movie to begin with. Heck, I had to look up his name for this review. Add on to that a very clunky and short final fight, and there isn't much here to really enjoy with this villain other than his performance. Overall, if they would have shortened the film a little bit, focused more on the villain and less on Spock on Genesis, there were seriously way too many scenes of that, had a couple small mentions of elements from previous films to get people up to speed, and given Lloyd a bit more to do other than just fly a ship in the film, then it would have been a better viewing experience for me. But for now, I have to give it an above average 6 out of 10. did your stinking review. You can't do anything to it now, you bum. Go away. Why do all these people follow me everywhere? Why can't they just leave me alone? Jeez. I already did your stinking review. You can't do anything to it now, you bum. Go away. Voyage Home was the fourth Star Trek film, but third in a storyline that was started by Wrath of Khan. Sequels aren't always used as cash-ins. They can also be there to tie up loose ends from the previous film. With Search for Spock, Spock's mind isn't all the way back, Kirk has to answer for all of the laws he broke, and as for Savik, Eh, let's just leave her on the planet we start the film on. Goodbye forever! Yes, the crew must now face the music back on Earth. But with the Enterprise gone, they must replace it with a new marketable toy. Now we get to see this film's contribution to the Trek pantheon of super villainy! A probe? Just a probe. Did you at least see who sent the probe? Nope. Ugh. So it's sent to Earth not to communicate with humans, but instead to a being that it spoke with long before we existed, humpback whales. But they're all extinct in 2286, and with the probe destroying Earth, Kirk and the crew decide to time travel back to when the whales still existed. So another environmental message, huh? Yeah. To be fair, the Star Trek franchise was always rooted in allegories of real-world issues. The difference here, however, is instead of a metaphor of whaling, it flat out is whaling. So what other reason should we set the film in the same year it happened to be made in? Going back to the TV series, it's the 23rd century and yet they're embracing the 1960s culture. With the films, however, they never really metafictionally acknowledged what decade they were made in. So in a way, this film compensated for that by plainly inserting our crew in 1986 so they could react to the viewer's world. Then there's the cut and dry plot. I mean, Kirk practically sets a laundry list for the film to follow. Sure, you had conflicts sprout from each task, but they were quickly dealt with once each started. So we have the character arcs to fall back on. The Vulcan half of Spock's mind has fully returned, but not the human half. So he spends this whole movie gaining back what previously took three seasons and two movies to get. Kirk's arc is pretty much repetitive at this point. I must do the right thing when everyone's telling me not to, and then I'll love a woman. The rest of the crew each manages to at least have their own moment. Scotty gets to be a thespian, Sulu gets to fly a helicopter, and Chekhov gets to be injured so McCoy can criticize modern medicine. It makes them a bit more memorable than in their last couple appearances. But what about a real villain? I guess after two movies of the villain rubbing in Kirk's face how deliciously evil they were, we needed to take a breather and have a more ambiguous antagonist. Once the crew is back to the future with the two whales on board, and the probe finally gets to talk to them, it just... leaves? Why was it destroying the planet? 
What did the whale say to it to make it stop? Were we just not supposed to know? Is it just not supposed to be black and white like it usually is? Either way, we get that precious status quo for the sequels I guess we needed. Overall, Star Trek The Voyage Home felt a little anticlimactic as a trilogy closer, but still is a welcome chapter in the ongoing saga with its own distinct identity. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, uh, Mr. Goodplot. That match, kid. I'm going to leave you as you left me, as you left Mr. Cool. Trapped forever in a review you want nothing to do with. A review with no villains for you to talk about. Villainless. Villainless. Kid! 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 I was right in my ear. Okay, uh, that Mad Kid here with challenge, what's this, five? Round five? Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, questions for round five. Uh, well, so why did I pick what I picked? Well, I didn't. That was, that was, uh, Cap's job. But, I guess, um, I did Wrath of Khan, um, not really because I, like, wanted to do Wrath of Khan, but, um, uh, Mr. Cool and Good Plot, uh, called dibs on the other two. Which, you know, at first I was like, oh, I was kind of surprised. I'm like, you know, Wrath of Khan, wouldn't you want to review that one? But then I quickly realized how much um, that reviewing Wrath of Khan sucked. Uh, so getting to the most challenging part of this review um, was, A, I, I don't know that much about Star Trek. Don't. I've, uh, uh, junior and senior year of high school, I was really into Next Generation. So I've seen all of Next Generation. I haven't seen any of the Next Generation movies, though. But I've seen all of the show. Um, and, uh, I've seen, like, a handful of TOS episodes, and I had seen Khan quite a few times before this, actually. I do like that movie. Um, so I've seen all that, and then I saw the newer movies when they came out, um, 09 and Into Darkness. But that's about it, as far as my Star Trek knowledge goes. So, going into this review, um, you know, I felt like... I had to do a full-on spoiler analysis of it, because what else would be the point of reviewing Wrath of Khan? You know, everyone knows about it. Everyone knows that Spock dies in it. Everyone knows, you know, it's like three decades old. So I figured doing a full analysis was really the only way to approach it, but I also felt like I didn't have a ton of new things to bring to the table outside of kind of stuff that's already been talked about with the movie. And I felt like I didn't have a lot of, like, insight because... Um, you know, I'm not a big Star Trek guy, so I didn't have a ton of, like, insight to bring to the to the review. So those were kind of some big hurdles to overcome. Uh, and also figuring out how to work with, um, you know, my teammates and how much to work with them. Uh, so what did I enjoy most about this challenge? Uh, sort of same thing as, some, as the last challenge, I guess, just in that um, it got me outside of my comfort zone doing full-blown narrative reviews of films isn't really something I want to do necessarily, but it was kind of cool to kind of get that experience. Um, but also the time limit was a big, uh, as it always is, a big challenge here because uh, it's a very dense movie. You know, there's a lot of stuff I want to get into, like, you know, comparing, uh, you know, the Moby Dick to, like, A Tale of Two Cities and kind of the thematic ideas going on with those. And um, I would have liked to have delved a little bit more into, like, Kirk's relationship with his... Uh, with his ex and his son, and just, there's, there's a lot to unpack in that movie, and, you know, I just, you know, you can't get to all of it in, you know, five, four and a half, five minutes. Um, what I enjoyed most about this challenge, uh, working with, uh, Ben and Good Plot was great. I really liked those guys, it was fun to work with them, um, and I think doing kind of crossover fun stuff is cool. Uh, if I could have more time, or if I did again, I think this review suffered a little bit from not having enough planning, I would have spent a little bit more time writing it, um, you know, having a, a job, like having a more full-time job has been kind of rough on my ability to, you know, spend a lot of time dedicated to doing this kind of stuff, so uh, that's, you know, that was rough, just I'm still dealing with, 
kind of getting into a new groove. And so uh, I think I would probably just spend a little bit more time in the writing stages. Um, uh, you know, reviewing something I didn't get to pick was weird, but it was kind of cool. Um, cause it, it's like, all right, you know, you now have this one thing you got to focus on it. And, um, it was strange, but it was, it was in the experience. And I worked pretty closely with Good Plot and Mr. Cool. We kind of, um, we had a couple Skype calls and we exchanged ideas and talked about what we thought would be fun to do. And we figured since we have Good Plot, we should use that character. Uh, we figured that character would be the most natural way to kind of bring our videos together. So, um... Yeah, I don't know which... I, I honestly think this is anybody's game. Uh, I, I waited to watch all three of the other team's videos before I made this, and they're all pretty solid. Um, and so I don't know. Like, this round is anyone's round. I, I hope we'll be safe, um, but we'll see. I mean, this is... It's getting to the point where there's really no terrible videos. So, uh, yeah. See you guys next time. Hey there, guys. It's Ben again doing his interview for this round of Who Reviews the Reviewers, where we have to review a bunch of Star Trek things. Yay. Uh, either way, to answer the questions, as we always do, uh, why'd I pick what I reviewed? I didn't. <laughs> this is the one time where I can say I didn't pick it. Uh, you know, as you can see from the last round, Cap did. Uh, well, we had to pick a different, we ha I guess we kind of had to pick each round, and it was more so just, I picked what I picked because, um, honestly, it was just because the other two called dibs. That was really it. <laughs> I mean, I guess I expected to get more out of the review than I did. That's the, that's the thing. And I'll explain, I guess, what I mean more in a second. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I picked it really just because there was nothing else left to pick. They, uh, Matt picked Wrath of Khan and Good Plot picked, uh, Four, whatever it's called, I'm trying to remember. Yeah, Vo Voyage Homer, if that's what it's called, I don't know. But he picked that pretty much right away, and then Matt picked Wrath of Khan, so then I'm like, alright, I guess I'll do Star Trek Three. Um, hardest part of the review, I'll definitely say, was was the whole review itself, because I'm going to be honest with this one, I'm not very happy with this review at all. Thinking like thinking back to it, I really didn't put my heart into it, my, my, I didn't put any effort into it really. I just kind of wanted to get it done, get it over with, just because, as I say in the video, I'm not really a big Star Trek guy, I never have been. I mean, I like it, okay, but it's like, and even just watching the movie, that movie, there wasn't much for me to... So there's nothing really to sink my teeth into with it, so it really just feel like just okay, let's get it done. And I guess I should, I do feel bad about that because I really should have done a better job with the whole thing. Um, so yeah, the hardest part of the review was uh, if I have to pick one element, it'd probably be just watching the movie in general, just because that was, it was. I'm sorry, Cap. I know you like it, but I found it ridiculously boring. <laughs> um... I, I, it, it took me, like, a couple try. I had to keep pausing just to get through it. I, I really didn't enjoy watching it all that much. And then, like, the actual script wasn't too bad, but then, of course, I realized now that I should have dug into it a little bit more, but, uh, yeah. Uh, what would I do differently? I'd probably do an entire... I'd probably do the review completely differently now than I know that I should have... Like, I should... Because well, watching Matt's and uh, Good Plot's review, and the other ones as well... I really should have tried to go deeper into the movie than I did, because I really just kind of went on it as at face value, and I mean, I mentioned a couple of small things here and there, like with, uh, the, with the comedy relief also being, like, a main factor into the story, and I felt that was kind of a, an interesting thing to do for a film, because I really hadn't seen that before. Um, with it, I do, I definitely... I definitely would go more into it, and I probably would shorten the skit elements of it, but I wanted to get, I wanted both of them to get a, kind of their time in the sun kind of thing. Like, I wanted them to, I wanted to make it very clear that Matt and Good Plot were like, they weren't just like, oh, here they are, here they are, and then boom. And I guess I did spend too much time with them on that. Um, will I get Top Banana? I, as with every single round... No, I don't. Especially this time, because this, this is definitely my worst review yet. Um, 
with the well then again I, I guess the thing is I don't it, it, if we had top bananas this round I guess I don't really know if we would but we had individual top bananas anyway I wouldn't really no I wouldn't I definitely wouldn't say so just cause it was a weak review I didn't really delve into it as much as I should have and I I don't really bash myself this time but it's just it's how I feel do I think I'm safe Mm. I, I'm not sure. I probably not. I don't think I'm safe with this one just because the review itself did turn out pretty bad. I'm not awful, but like, uh, it didn't turn out as good as it should have. I, I mean, I'm in, I'm in round five now. I, the review should be turning out better than this. Definitely, they should be turning out. I mean, I should be making top tier stuff, and I'm still making amateur stuff at this point. So no, I don't think I'm safe. If I'm kicked off this round, then. That's it. I'm done. I'm gone. <laughs> it won't be too big of a deal. I mean, I won't be too surprised, but we'll see how it turns out. Either way, I hope you guys enjoy the rest of the competition, and or the rest of this round, anyway. And uh, we'll see you, hopefully, I'll, hopefully, at the very least, I'll see you at the next round. Alright, bye-bye. So how did I feel reviewing something that was chosen for me? Well, it's still felt like I had um, just about as much freedom as usual because, you know, this time we still got to choose uh, which of the three uh, choices and so um, didn't feel too different than before. Uh, they, what, what was different was knowing that now that they know what I'm reviewing uh, because they chose it, that means that there's um, certain criteria that they might expect but very specific stuff that they might be looking for um, how I tackle. So it was different in that way that now there was um, stuff to consider that wasn't um, there before. Uh, now that I was uh, reviewing something that uh, they knew I was reviewing. As for working uh, in a team, uh, we actually did check in each uh, on each other uh, quite a lot. You know, we did make sure uh, that we knew uh, how we wanted to connect to the, the videos. Uh, right from the start, uh, the other two agreed that uh, because uh, apparently I'm what they call a, 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 a fictional a, a fictional character or something. I don't know what they mean by that, but apparently because of that, they thought, okay, this is a cool way to do sort of maybe a little story arc um, uh, between the reviews uh, so we did it that way although I'm still confused what they mean by me being a fictional character now the most difficult part of the challenge had nothing to do with uh, doing this as a team or reviewing something that was chosen for me really what was hard was um, was doing this while uh, dealing with a, a, a sickness a uh, hum, uh, not to alarm anybody, but yes, uh, I was doing this while I was recovering from something, and um, it was mostly uh, of the ear, so uh, if I ever had to speak for a long time or speak too loudly, it would uh, put a lot of pressure here, so... Um, it was a matter of doing the re I, by the way, to clarify, I am, I am better now, I am better now, but, uh, not when I was filming, though, so it was a matter of, uh, trying to do it when it was at, when the sickness when it was at its low points, when it wasn't as extru excruciatingly painful to, uh, do it. Um, now I know what you're thinking, well, why didn't you, well, why, why didn't you tell somebody? Why, well, why even do it if it was hurting you to do it. Well, you know, um, th th as they sh say, the show must go on. And, you know, I, I, and I did heal as I hoped I would. So, you know, it was a chance I, 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 I was sort of willing to take. And, you know, I, I don't think it was that big of a thing. Uh, something I would have done differently if I did this review again, um, I would have gotten more used to the editing software before I did this review. Uh, that's another challenge I had uh, this round was that um, that my previous uh, 
for uh, reasons withheld, um, I was not, I am no longer able to use my current editing software, so I had to uh, change over to a new one, and um, it was during the, uh, it was during the raw upload challenge, funny enough, so I thought, okay, cool, that means, uh, you know, since this challenge literally it, it means that I can't edit, that gives me plenty of time to get used to uh, the new editing software I have. And I didn't. I uh, unfortunately, yeah, I, I, uh, I, 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 I kind of waited to the last minute to get used to it uh, to uh, do to uh, do this uh, round. So uh, yeah, that is a bit of a regret. Hopefully, it doesn't show too much in the video that uh, the uh, current. Um, hopefully it's not uh, too noticeable in the video that uh, the current um, editing software I'm using uh, I had to get used to. Do I think I'll win Top Banana? Well, frankly, at this point, um, well, as evidenced by the last round, uh, you know, we're lucky enough to even stay in the competition now. And also, I just realized that there's no Top Banana this round, so I don't know why I just brought that up. I can't believe I didn't get a triple joke. I can't believe I did not get a data joke. Hey, you still got a joke regarding one robot from Star Trek. Do you think all robots are the same? Hey, don't twist my words. <laughs> <laughs>